Welcome to the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners recommendation Tuesday, May 16th, 2023. Um, can we have a roll call, please? I'll start. <coughs> Commission Chair Peck. Chair, Chair Joseph Peck. Commissioner Aaron Rodriguez. Commissioner Mark Chub Marjorie. Commissioner Sean McCoy. Commissioner in two members. Um, Interim Executive Director Harold Dominguez. Housing Compliance Manager Tracy Francisco. Accounting Supervisor Kendra Daniel. Housing Director Molly O'Donnell. Lisa Gallagher, Regional Housing Manager. Executive Assistant Eric Adams. Commissioner Susie Lalda Ferry. Commissioner Shiki Lalda. Great. 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 Thank you. Um, do we have any agenda revisions or submissions of documents here? No, it's all good. All right. We need to approve the minutes for April 18th. Can I have a motion? We uh, approve the minutes from April 18th and Tuesday. Second. Okay, so the, uh, the minutes have been in. Uh, the motion to approve the minutes were made by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by uh, Commissioner um, Rodriguez. Is there any discussion of the minutes? Seeing none, can we just have a vote? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? So that passes. Uh, we have public invited to be heard. Are you here to speak? Yes. Yes, great. Okay, you have three minutes and your name in uh, advance, please. Okay. So I so would say if we're going to refer to anyone who's a tenant, um, no, no room numbers, no names, because this is recorded and I think it's available for the public. Uh, okay. okay. No names, no nothing, just talk. No numbers, no where they live. Not where they live, where they live. Just talk. Yes. That's why I came. I've got the Jiro. I know what. So, um, along with housing, and Advisory Board and City Council, Joan, Harold, Lisa, and all of you special people. Thank you for letting me come and talk. I come because I care about where I live, where I've lived for seven years, because I care about uh, what kind of things that are my neighbors, myself. Uh, I try to show kindness and caring, but we're kind of having some chaos and a lot of noise since more in situations since I've been living there seven years uh, that's kind of getting interesting to kind of deal with um, uh, a lot of neighbors where I live have shared with me the same thing that I'm talking about a, a lot of noise late at nights like people leaving their TVs on loud machines um, running their sweeper like one did above me through the night, dragging their furniture. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, sleep, and you never there's no never no quiet time. Uh, we you know like we can expect the dishwasher, the air conditioner, the garbage disposal to make noise, but when people aren't considerate of others, when it's quiet time when you when you've got to have some quiet time to rest and sleep and otherwise that can cause health problems which is not really uh there's a lot of people there and they have talked uh, i like my managers and uh, i i try not to have problems with anybody i show kindness caring i show kindness to different neighbors and stuff but um it's kind of like that we, we keep getting different ones and the thing is is I think they their sales can only do so much uh, they don't really have the authority to do certain things so they kind of just brush it off and act like well too bad live with it and that really is not good so uh, I just came to say that myself that I feel like that um, some way we ought to be able to address this because I'm getting old and precious, it might not look like it, but safety and, you know, you got to have rest. It's just not comfortable to deal with that off and on. My neighbor above me, I did go address it to her and she quit for a little while and she had some misses. One down below me, she complained a little bit about me and we worked it out too. 
So there isn't, you know, is I don't try to be unkind. I try to be compassionate, show kindness and safety. I, I feel like this is not even safety because after a while people get agitated. So I just wanted to come and say this in a nice way that I like where I live. It's a wonderful place. I like the people. We're, we, we're kind of like family. We care about each other and we show, I show kindness. I show caring. I don't try to be unkind in any way. And I feel like in some way that this is not being addressed. So that's why I came to say, uh, say about it in a nice way because I feel like that, um, it should be that way. Thank you. You know, yeah. thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Lord bless you. Thank you. Are you going to address? So we have opening business. Um, first one on the, I guess it is old business, resolution 202316, uh, the about the CBDG. TV grant fund, accessibility problem. Sure, so um, commissioner, well, board of commissioners and board chair, oops, switch gears. Um, uh, this item is just the acceptance of those CDBG CV grant funds for those accessibility improvements. The city council approved this a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like any other questions or comments on that or have questions, let us know. Move acceptance. <clears throat> so, uh, Commissioner Martin moved acceptance of the CDBG grant uh, 2023-16, seconded by Commissioner uh, Waters. I do have a question. Have you started when I'm when I'm reading this? It says uh, sign permit construct rehabilitation improvements. Um, and have you started bidding at that yet? Or We're in bidding. In bidding right now, bidding. so none of the construction started. Okay, great. So those, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So that passes unanimously. And now in resolution 2023, First Amendment to IGA to accept ARPA fund grants for Holy Street development. So this will help me with a statement on this. Um, you. As a board accepted ARPA funds already in the amount of $800,000 for the Hobart project, that is going into the purchase of the land. This is an additional $600,000 that is becoming coming in because of a reorganization of the budgets across the projects in the in the ARPA affordable housing project list. So that's why this is coming forward. So it'll be used more on the project expenses, pre-development technical expenses, or things at closing. Great. Okay. Can I have a motion for resolution 2023 I'll move approval. Second. Uh, <coughs> Commissioner Spadago Ferry moved approval of 2023-17, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. Resolution 2023-18, uh, amendment to the Zenu Shared Use Agreement. So again, um, we are preparing for the Zinnia project to close on its financing on May 24th. And so this is um, the second to last item that would come to you for consideration. The last one we have to bring as a special item at the city council meeting um, on the 23rd. So this one is just, ex uh, just amending our existing shared use agreement between uh, the suites LLLP, which is the entity that owns the suites, um, and the city who owns a portion of the land there on that site um, to ensure responsibilities and um, just allow the use basically. And so this amends it to allow the Zinnia project into that as well and outlines uh, their responsibilities and specifically allows a construction easement to occur on the land around the, the property. So that's what this one's for. Great. Okay. <laughs> I have a motion for 2023 AP. So moved. Second. All right, so that was moved by uh, Commissioner Waters, uh, seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough. Is there any discussion of this one? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? So that passes unanimously. We need to review and accept the 2022 audit. That would be you. 
Um, so I've, I've done three slides just kind of as a synopsis. I know you've got the 80 page document. Um, so to start off the financial highlights, um, we received pretty much the same amount of grant funding last year, um, um, 5.8 million, and we also received 5.8 million in 2021. So there was no really changes there. Um, cash and investments, um, we did increase about 681,000, and that, that was related to about 523K in developer fees that came from AMSA and the suites. And then we also had an increase in our HCB admin as we're starting to, when we came on board in 2020, we were actually at a negative net position. We were spending too much of our HCB admin. And a lot of that is because of the executive director and you know that, that those costs that come with that. So we were in a negative position. We've got ourselves in a positive position now. Um, and we've kind of increased, we didn't have as many expenses on our HCB program um, as we had in years past. So that brought up um, our cash and the investments as well. Our current ratio is at 9.95. And so that's that's really good. We made a big jump. And a big piece of that is our Briarwood loan. Last year it was a current liability, which was up 500,000. It was due this year, and we refinanced it to a long term. So um, for a fit over a 15 year period. Sorry, ratio of what to what? Oh, so the current ratio is like how how well can you liquidate your funds? So if you you want it higher, not lower, because then it means you're not at a good like if, if something happened and you needed to pay all your current liabilities and current assets, if you were too low, you wouldn't be able to do it. So the higher we are, the more cash we have coming in, the more AR we have coming in to pay all the liabilities that are on the books. And then the expendable funds, we also went up on that too, and that's just the ability to pay our monthly expenses. Our net position, okay, um, we did increase there uh, about 2.7 million, and that will go to the next slide. Um, we have seven different funds. We have our general fund, we have our housing choice vouchers, we have our mod rehab, which is our SRO. We have Briarwood 615 Main, the LRA program, which is funded by the city of Longmont, and the Longmont Suites. Most of them all um, had increases except for 615 Main Street, and I that is because of the snow removal. Um, because our snow removal contract was so much different this year, um, it increased our expenses, which lowered our net position for that particular address. Um, our general fund was basically due to our operating the grant and developer fees and our non-operating interest is where that 2.4 million increase comes in our net position. And for housing choice vouchers, we were in a negative position in 2021 and now we're in a positive. A lot of that is because of the declining catch up um, with our admin expenses. We had overspent. When we came on in 2020, we had overspent way too much of our admin expenses. So we were playing some catch up and now we're, we're caught up but we're trying to figure out how in the in the long term will we be able to bring an executive director on and be able to fund out of both of our management fees and our HCB voucher in the current housing and then last is our single audit findings so um, we had four this year we didn't have any financial statement findings but we did have two HQS inspection findings. Um, they uh, inspected about 20 files. They found that one had um, didn't have an inspection before their certification was done. Um, we fixed that in the system. There was what we call an checkmark in here that was checked. And so basically that's now checked that says you can't move forward with doing the certification until the inspection is done. Um, so all of these have been corrected. Um, the HQS inspection for the second one was there is a 24 hour requirement that if an inspection fails and it's due to HQS health and safety standards, that you have to do another inspection within 24 hours from the landlord. Tell me if I'm speaking wrong. Well. The landlord has to get those corrections done within those 24 hours. Um, and we did make that mark on that one. 
we could verify it, the, the um, consultant that we used for the inspections. Um, couldn't find the document that would show the 24 that had been repairs in her email, so um, we couldn't we couldn't prove that it was done within 24 hours. The next one was due to rent reasonableness. So when they go through certification, they have to print off a rent reasonableness. It's a particular part of the process. Unfortunately, for several of these files, they were. The HCD specialists knew they had to do that, but they were printing the wrong document. So because we had to print the correct document during the audit, um, we received the money for that. Can you tell me what that means, rent reasonableness? Reasonableness. Okay. So anytime that a uh, um, voucher person leases up for the first time, or if the landlord is, going, is planning on raising the rent, we have to compare that unit to three other units in long lot to make sure that the rent that they're charging is reasonable um, and comparable to the rest of the, the properties. Um, and the, the staff member that was, was doing that was just pretty much. Yeah, this was an interesting one. We actually had the right form and they did it right. They just printed out the wrong form and put it in there. And because they had to print it out at the time, they had the right it. And then the last one was our um, ARPA funding that we received. There was a reporting requirement that was missed, but was corrected during audit. And we submitted all of our quarterly reports that we um, had to, and is it on our compliance monitoring <laughs> to get those fixed, uh, to get those issued every year. So those are the four findings that we received. Um, they've all been corrected. Um, and we'll have a corrective, I mean, we'll have a corrective act to plan that actually outcomes that. Commissioner Well, you, you might have answered the question I was going to ask. Those were all labeled as <clears throat> the causes of lack of internal control. Yeah. For all four of those. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the remedy is one thing. Yes. And then the, the, the corrective action is something else. So, are is there correspondence you, that you are generating with the outlines the corrective action? Yeah. So well, for, we have a copy of that? Yes. Yes. So for example, the first one would be our corrective action was we fixed your need to not allow um, that. So there's got to be some yeah. documentation yeah. on this. And there's I assume that yeah. will be part of that. We'll be dialed into that. Correct. 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 So if I can maybe add something to that. Um, is there a uh, a, a process amendment that's going to ha happen, a training amendment, so that because all of this were, was people making mistakes. How do you keep people from making mistakes? What changes were made? I, I can address the, the HQS stuff. Um, we started, <coughs> they weren't doing inspections during the COVID 19, they were self certified. So when we came in, they weren't using their module for HQS inspections. Um, they didn't mean me, but LHA before us to the Lord. Yeah, they weren't, they using, weren't using that, that module. So we implemented it. And then there was an update that because they hadn't updated their, their ERD system for several years. So then there was an update. And what that did is um, when when um, reports are, are when, when I ran the reports, it wasn't capturing all the units that needed to be inspected or all the problems that, that they, they saw here. Um, and we're, we're dialing that in. We've got, um, we're already looking at um, that module and trying to figure out why it's not pulling all of the, the information that we need in order to, to do the, the inspections for would you spell the R D and define it? Y A R I D I D I D R D Y A R D I. And I don't know what that means, but it's a software. That has <laughs> it's, a it's, it's a property management. It's a property yeah. management software. And there's modules. There's you know the light tech module. There's the H C D module. There's the waiting list module. And then there's the H Q S the inspection module. Um, and so we're just getting into the HQS module, and so we've got to work out some of the, the problems. Well, 
Okay. Well, part of the question, or part of the answer is on the other side with the residents and um, certifications, one of the things they also did implement that we had heard in the last advisory board meeting is really the online portal for both, both landlords and voucher holders to utilize, which we're utilizing at um, Florida County. And so that's something we're looking at too, because we're trying to use the automated, because if you can automate it, then you can start minimizing some of those pieces. But they've gotten a number for that. I, you know, I want to evaluate it in terms of what that means for staff time and some other issues. And that very well may be something that we're going to bring through more quickly if we can verify that. Quick question. Um, are the audits random or do you all know in advance when they're coming to audit? So um, they do a sample. So they have us um, give a us their so well give them several lists, you know, who are the new people, who are the who what are all the failed inspections and then they do a sample of that. Um, and then we were given that prior ahead of time um, to get the files correct. So do you all um, one of the questions I have is, do you ever have a compliance go in before the audits? And I know you all are super busy, but um, when you know there's an audit, do you go in and just review those files just to make sure? Because that's very important. Then you catch stuff like that. If the, the forms are, the documents are not right, then you can replace them. And, have to print them out correctly. So it is important to, if compliance could go in prior to the audit, to do a pre-audit beforehand, and then those eyes will catch it beforehand. And so, so I did. Mm -hmm. And um, so on the, um, which one? the um, document that she was printing out wrong, I didn't catch it because it was the wrong. It was the wrong form, so I didn't. I didn't catch that. I saw it. Saw that it was there, but it was the wrong form. Um, and the inspections that um, the twenty-four hours, we rely on the consultants to, to have that, and we didn't. So now what we're going to do is have them send us the document because they usually get just a picture or a work order showing that like maybe the smoke detector was put on. So we're going to have them give that to us. And so we can attach it to the failed inspection. So that should take care of, of that. What was happening before? The, the landlord would just send it to the consultant that does the inspections and they would approve the, the 24 hour inspection and then do another one and upload it into the other one. Um, Not going through you? No, no. They do, they do it on a handheld device and then when they're done, then they upload it and it, it, it goes into the RD and then it goes, supposed to go to the tenant's file. Um, That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. I mean, because, now I'm just mentioning, this is so long ago since I was in housing, but um, they had, there was a separate housing inspe uh, HQS inspection, but it was still part of the housing authority, but they had their own separate department. So that department, you know, and it's just, when you said consultant, that just blew my mind. Like, you have a consultant to go in and do what? Well, so, I like it's a, it's a company that does HQS inspections. And I think um, housing, Boulder Housing Partners use a, uses them. Yeah. Um, and, and we had decided to use them because when, when we walked in and the self-certifications that were done for a couple of years, we had to go in and do all of those inspections again. Right. And it was just it was just too much. And um, I think it would be too much for the staff to do it right now. We've we've gone through we've got one person that's been here for a year and now we're training a, the third person. Well we've had two other people and now we're training another person. So I think eventually it would be nice to be able to do it in-house. I do HQS inspections, I do the quality control inspections, so there's a training there that can happen, but we're just not yet. Um, 
you have the, it may be on the next slide, but do you have the comparison to the last audit? Or is this all in stuff that you didn't do because of the pandemic? We didn't have any last audit. So there's nothing to compare it to. We had zero findings last audit. Okay. Um, this is the five. Is that, is that because how long have we been, you know, just giving me up to speed, how long have we been the authority? So last year was the first year that we had no findings. The year before that, we had like four or five. We still had several. We had a lot of financial statement findings along with um, some HUD findings. Um, but a lot of what has also happened is there's been a lot of workers these last couple of years, so they haven't had to test everything that they had to test this year. Um, I do know the rent reasonableness was actually a finding on their side with HUD. HUD told them they weren't doing their job in, in testing the rent reasonableness, so that was something added that might not have been tested in prior years, um, and it was tested this year. I think these are good to see where we do have breaks in the system now that we're actually trying to utilize liberty to liberty. I think we're paying for more, more features that we're not utilizing, but we need to have checks and balances and reports that are functioning correctly because it wasn't being used correctly in the past. Um, so that's what we're trying. I know she's working on inspections and we're trying to get um, that. Yeah, I think the good news for me is that on the financial side, we didn't have any findings because of all of the waivers. This is the first time we've really dug in since we've had it into this piece based on what we were doing. And so, I mean, we're going to obviously learning from this. Um, the ARPA, ARPA findings is actually interesting because I think we did that for ourselves in that the money that we we put in as a city contract to go into Kristen. Um, we put a requirement for quarterly reports that went into Kristen as a one time fund. So, in, a, in our minds, it was spent because it went in. But because the project's not closed and the agreement that we create on our side requires quarterly reports, even though the money's spent and you're not doing anything with it. So that's another learning moment for us in the sense of if you're going to put the money in on the front, front end, we need to think about how we write the agreement for the city on our side and the city side to not create that issue to happen. So it, it's according to the report that says put the money in, but the project is not closed. Just two observations. One is having been in those conversations when HA started the conversion plan. It is not a simple conversion. It is a major and complex software package. So the learning curve is steep, number one. Number two, everybody, the first thing I look at, you know, part of the letter to management, you know, what are the deficiencies? I mean, kind of that's what it's about. But but not to focus so much on that, so much as on what are we learning what we need to learn. But if you looked at the audits before, I don't know, nine findings, uh, both non-compliance and financial issues um, you know, to see the audit now compared to what it was. So Sean, just know this is a light year improvement over what we had seen. So, you know. we, we definitely think that this is the year that everyone says, okay, city, you've been with LHA now for going on three years. Show us. Show us what you've done. And so we're getting monitored heavily. Um, everyone wants to see what things look like. This stuff is very much down to the yeah. crossing T's and dotting I's it is so. I, I will also say that our auditors gave us a compliment that we have turned the housing authority like 360 um, because when they would show up, they would not even have files. They wouldn't even talk about it. <laughs> So they were able to actually draft our audit at the very end and they never actually ever had been able to do that. Really? Um, so within the, the five days they were here, they had a draft on it at the very end. 
So as yeah. opposed to having to go away and come back to come back and, and and follow up and follow up and follow up because they weren't finding files, they weren't you know and that rarely happens. <laughs> rarely. Yeah. Happens. So, that's so good. yeah, so they, so they haven't seen that any housing authority. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, and just you know, from a management perspective, this is what I want to see <laughs> because as you're trying to dig in and, and now really get to the nuances and the details, you want to see it kind of get to this level because now it's not surface level. You're digging down into the granular information, and so that that's also good. And, and we're learning stuff about yard endings. It's like Tracy said, how do you fix it? You check the box. Mm. Well, that's a learning moment, and you already in what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said on the ARPA, we created that ourselves based on our own contract. Mm -hmm. We knew that it was going to be spent on the front end of the project. So we're learning also how do we structure contracts uh, when the money is just dropping in and then it's, it's, it's gone. So, um, used to be Baker back in the day, we would do. Internal audits, and then we have we hire somebody to uh, audit us, and then the, the federal is that come in and we audit us, and uh, and so the thing that uh, you're talking about is is you just uh, is the federal would come in. And audit. This was our outside audit. Our outside audit. Outside. So financial, but because we get federal funds, we have an additional requirement that they have to do a single audit. And what the single audit is, is um, the White House basically does this compliance supplement every year and it says you have to test on these certain things. So for every type of federal funding, they come and they have to test them to make sure that we're in compliance with what HUD wants us to be in compliance with that year. Mm -hmm. So that when you find something and fix it, they like that. And uh, if you don't find something, uh, but they find it, they like that too, I think, to a certain degree, because then, you know, everybody makes a little bit of a statement as your, your learning curve with this yard is coming on. You're getting better at that, it's not here. Yeah, and I would say even in years past, what they were seeing is the exact same findings over and over and over again. So they were doing corrective action plans, but nothing was getting corrected because they were still kind of And your accountability for, for me should be we shouldn't see the same findings again. Right. My accountability for them is we shouldn't see the same findings again because you must be. that, gets into, so that gets into systemic issues. And what you're trying to do, you're Fixing the system is part of the audit results. Um, uh, you mentioned the tenants' files and uh, I think the landlord's file too, the housing employment firm. Uh, are these paper files at the beginning of the project process? You still do, do you still do the paper? That was a software that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. It looked at doing a conversion to doing it online. Um, we know that the landlords like it a lot more when, um, it's, online. when it's online and we'll, uh, we're hearing <coughs> decisions as to which voucher to take based on that. Um, we have recently been involved with residents that aren't physically able to update online. You will always have somebody that mm -hmm. you have to manage. Um, and the thing that I'm most interested in, in in this is that when you automate it, I think there's some inherent capacity building that occurs in, in the amount of time it takes staff to, to, to dig into the, to each one of these files. So we're we're evaluating that right now. I think Tracy sent me an email. It's 20,000-ish now, and then 31, 37, 35,000 year after that. So what we're trying to do is figure out financially how they can do that to start shifting into that model. But that that doesn't mean we won't have the paper files because when when they come in and do the audit, they will they want to see the paper files. Um, so we'll always have the paper files, but the, the tenants can come in and do all their paperwork online and submit it to us online instead of coming in and, and filling it out by hand and handing it to us. Um, it will also 
cut down on misplacing files. You know, we get a lot of people that says, well, I came in and I, I, I turned it in and we say, well, no, you didn't. So it, it would be really helpful. I'll add on to that. I don't think we know exactly fully what this package is capable of. So, so with that said, the auditors do have access to Yardi. They have you know, access to be able to view. So if we can make it an online type of process, the auditors would have access to so, that, but we just don't yeah. know. Fully. So if somebody fills a form in by hand, does somebody in your organization have to transcribe it in the order? Um, no, the information that we get, I mean, there's, because it's a federal program, there's several documents that have to be signed every year. Yeah. Um, and then income verification. And so a lot of, a lot of paperwork. And then they take that information, like the, the income verification, and they'll put that into Yardi. And that's where it will calculate the rents and. Okay, I'm sorry, but that didn't answer my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> How much? How much? How much transcription from a paper form to uh, uh, an on, uh, uh, online? We don't know. That's what we're exploring right now. Uh, yeah, but what's in your current process? When they get the forms, oh. what do they have to enter into your just, to, just the income just the stuff? income and assets and, and any daycare and medical deductions? It's the tenant that has to fill out all the paperwork and sign it. So they're the ones who have, it, it takes them a lot of time to yes. get that document. And so my that. question is, after they've done that, what do you do? How we, many don't, like we have to? So we take, take it, we make sure that all of the documents that, that are required is there. And then all they do is they take the income information and put that into your Okay, so a, a fraction of yeah. what's on that front. Right. I think what you're asking is how, how that you have to just basically go and, and put it in yes. uh, for them, is that right? Well, not, not right. for them. But they or in the system, in the system, is there a, a possibility of uh, somebody putting in the line? Yes, I'm a lot of things. But also just time that it takes. Yeah, the more you automate, the more you start removing human elements in it, mm -hmm. and that's what we want to assess in this new software package. Anybody have any more audit questions? Oh, that's my last slide. Oh, that's it for the audit. Okay. Any more? It looks like we've asked a lot of questions. <laughs> so, can I have uh, acceptance of a 2022 audit? So moved. Second. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Martin moved uh, acceptance of 2022 audit, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Let's uh, vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, I don't know what this next one means. So, the CMAP. <laughs> so then, if you recall, in February, we submitted our CMAP. It's yearly. Oh, um, right. Form okay. that that we we sent to HUD. And um, when we sent it out, we showed us at a ninety-eight percent, which is a high performance. When they got it, they um, looked at so when I'll have to explain. So when we do our documents in Yardi, we send them to HUD to what we call PIC. And so it takes everything that we've done and it sends it to, to HUD. And then HUD will look at it and and check to make sure our numbers are correct. Okay. Okay. So we got a response from HUD and it says that we went down from 98 to 92, which were still high performers. Mm -hmm. So so what I have changed on this is there's there's 14 um, indicators. And um, the continuing to, to do HKOS inspections went down to zero. We showed that we were doing that. So, so their information that they have in PIC shows that we're not doing them every two years like we're supposed to. And what we're finding is that the reports that we're, we're generating in order to show us what inspections need to be done are missing. Hmm. Files. We don't know why, it's kind of random. Um, so Yardi is looking, 
you've got a ticket in and they're, they're looking at those ones that aren't posting to, to pay. So, to kind of so, break it down, the files are in the RA system. Okay. They're not leaving the RA system and getting into PIC or it's not consistent. So it's a, this is our frustration with this. It, this yes. This system. So our frustration is we have the forms. It's mm -hmm. not automatically shifting in, and so HUD's not seeing it. And, and so that's what we're trying to resolve actually with the software company mm -hmm. to figure out why those forms, when they process it, aren't going through. Can you see them in your? I can see the them. missing I, ones. I can. I can see the inspections. Yeah, I can see the inspections when you do when you do the the um, pick report. What it does is it takes those inspections and it throws them into the tenant's file. Okay. Um, so then you can look in the tenant's file and see the see the um, inspection. Well, it's not throwing it into the tenant's file. We can we know that the inspection is done because we have we have the inspection, but it's not taking it from approval of the inspection and sending it to I don't know how yeah, we can manually pull them out yeah mm -hmm. we and can manually pull the inspections it's not shifting them out when we're hitting the button to do it so unfortunately HUD's process they don't call us and say I don't see anything they just gave us a zero mm -hmm. and then oh. certified it and we said, um, can we appeal that? Because this is a technical issue. We have a ticket. Yeah, yeah. And they said, no, because you're already a high performer. So there's no reason to appeal. You'll just still be a high performer. So we can't appeal our score because we're already at the right threshold. But from a perfectionist point of view and also just <laughs> fairness, we wanted to. But at this point, we can just tell them how we're correcting it via the PRD ticket. Well, and one, one other thing is the lease ups. There was a calculation that we had done um, and and we put ourselves down as a zero we didn't get any um, any points for that because we still weren't leased up mm -hmm. well they said that we were leased up and gave us 20 points so <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah you were leased up so um, Kendra and I had talked to, to uh, mm -hmm. um, about our two-year tool and we talked about this and, and they are like the, the auditors, they are very, very pleased with yeah. how um, how we're doing, especially with our visa. Um, we're above average. Yeah, she said we haven't seen that in a long time. Oh, that's great. So we've, yeah. we're, we're, we haven't fixed Yardi yet, <laughs> but Yardi is looking at it and we will. It sounds like artists. Yardy is trying to fix you all. Uh, it has. Well, it has. has. I guess the 360 will do. Yeah. I can honestly say that I don't think it was set up for success. No. It wasn't set up in 2018 successfully. So, there, and with them, out, with them not doing the upgrades for mm. like, I mean, we just did it this year. So, we were missing since 2018, four years. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Yardy was so bad <laughs> when we took it over that the H, uh, uh, Councilman Waters may, re may remember this, they were still going into the old system to process HCV applications. I don't even know if y'all knew that. Yeah, it's on my computer. I've been trying to get into it. <laughs> so, and, and that may be some of what we're seeing is that they were still doing work in the old system and they didn't fully migrate. They didn't fully, yeah, they didn't fully migrate and we just didn't set it up successfully. And we found, you know, like there's there's several files that they have the wrong social security number and the way that Yardi works is the head of the, the um, client is tracked by social security numbers. So they had the wrong social security number, so then they changed it. Well, that made a new, no. New file. Yeah. Oh. And they didn't delete the old one, so now we can, so those are showing up as not being inspected because of course they're not it's a different, they don't live it's there. A different file. They're not there. They're not <laughs> real. <laughs> so so those are the kind of things that we have to clean up and, oh, and that's an error by the Yardy software developer oh, seven years yeah. ago. 
shouldn't have done that. That's the name of the, it's a trailer water, as I recall. We were trying to work out a thing with, uh, we did the other, the other voluntary compliance. Voluntary compliance. You, you had to, you, you leaned into that. This is before we could do it. What's the status of the voluntary? We have completed everything on the list that was due. Um, our last word from HUD in February was, thank you, we'll check out the last deliverable and we'll let you know, and I have been totally quiet. That, was, that you just said no. That I don't remember the number of things of finding. It was staggering. Oh, yeah. the, the, the anticipated costs were overwhelming, and it looked like the end of the authority. Mm. I mean, it, the, the challenge of working it out was there was it, authority had no no capacity to work this out. It was part of the motivation for taking over the authority. So, I mean, you just got to understand how far it's come. Since those moments, we kind of work out these voluntary compliance. It was uh, it was it was frightening. Well, part of the closure is the CBG funds on the accessibility issues. That's that's the last piece, right? Um, actually, so the the actual co capital project is not required by the BCA, but it is related. Where so we did BCA. that physical accessibility survey and made yeah. sure we had a plan for the next seven years of capital. Do you get fined if you're out of compliance? Not, we did not be the, the BCA. Is there fines related to, I don't think so. It's just, their HUD's processes, they do findings, they can recapture funds. Um, that has not happened. Okay. I was just looking at the past LHA. So, they did. what can happen is HUD can come in and if it's not working, mm -hmm. they can put housing authorities into receivership, which I've actually seen a few times. Um, and they basically come in and take it over and, and redo things. For those of you that were here when we, to Council uh, Commissioner Waters' perspective, this voluntary compliance agreement, we actually stepped in before we were involved and helped facilitate a conversation with HUD to not go Hundred miles an hour on this one to do the voluntary compliance agreement. Um, what we subsequently found out from a conversation with HUD is they they told us we were getting ready to kind of talk to the city to, to step in on this one. Oh really? Mm. Yeah. So that's kind of the the dominoes were falling and mm -hmm. we just stepped in at a different time that mm -hmm. avoided maybe some of those and got hit with them. Um, but stepped in at a point to, before we got to the most significant the action. So do we need to do anything on the HCV program or CMAP? It's just the uh, just information. information. Okay, at the project uh, based voucher requests. Um, this is, I'll take this one. This is an informational update as well. We plan on, so if you recall, um, Back in February, we opened up our project-based voucher request for proposals period for senior housing, and then in um, in March, we went ahead and awarded that to the Village Choice Project, Village on Main Project. Um, so we are now opening up a second round, up to 18 vouchers focusing on family housing, and we do know we'll have at least two applicants. Um, one will be the Hover Project, and one will be a um, a privately operated affordable housing development that's also trying to take over tax credit. So this is just an, a heads up that we plan to open that up on Friday. It'll be open through June 30th, and then you all will consider that in July, the award. Um, that's just a heads up because there's a, it's very process driven and, and a lot of HUD requirements behind it. So it's just information. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're turning it over to you, Harold. Okay. I'm going to try to move pretty quickly through our updates. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, that we've been moving through a number of evictions. Mm -hmm. um, during the last one, and I'll have Lisa briefly give you the details, but Judge Martin expressed praise and thanks uh, on the team approach to avoid an eviction and one of the individuals we're dealing with. Um, 
can you really quickly at a high level kind of work me through what we were? Uh, well, Judge Martin was just impressed how the Longmont Housing Authority, our attorneys, the Longmont um, Mediation Services that the city sponsors, all can get together and we've seen it on so many cases that we can sit down and actually have a conversation that we're not, we're, we're getting to be a part of that today. We will negotiate with the tenants. Uh, one of the cases that he was referring to this last week is they, they need to go, but we sat there and we went back and forth mediation about four or five times between their attorneys, our attorneys, mediation services, and really came up with a plan that was workable for the family so that they had adequate time to be out and also the time frames that we needed. Um, so that's kind of the work that you can do all day <laughs> see is these, these processes that we have to go through are extremely time consuming. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we're doing when and we have a fair housing training that's coming up. So one of the things that when we're dealing with all of these issues is the, the number of requirements that we have to manage. So first and you know, say first and foremost, all of the fair housing rules are front and center for us anytime we're dealing with a situation. And, and that's really the holy grail in terms of how we have to deal with it. Um, the, the second piece, you'll touch ADA issues. Um, which can cover anything from physical disabilities and um, reasonable accommodations, which actually was one of the things that started the voluntary compliance agreement was the lack of reasonable accommodations in terms of dealing with ADA issues. So that, you know, front and center. So we have to um, work with all of those components. So, you, you know, the time, you just see the time commitment that you're dealing with in terms of when you have a situation and how you get through it developing the documentation, but even up to when they go into actual court for eviction, there's a lot of work that even occurs at that point. So um, I mentioned this to you all before. We have a lot of, we do everything we can to keep people housed because, you know, the issue just gets magnified when they're not housed. Um, monitoring trends for us um, can kind of get a sense of what we just talked about, but um, A, I think one of the things that none of us realized when we took it over is these organizations, uh, housing authorities are monitored to the 10th degree. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's because you get monitored by HUD, you get monitored by investors, you get monitored by DOMA, um, you get monitored by CHAFA. The mortgage company. The mortgage, I mean, so everybody's monitoring you. And I think what we're experiencing now to the point that Molly made earlier is they're digging in. Um, because they're like, okay, let's really see how you're doing. And so we're, we're just continuing to be in that um, monitoring phase. They're also catching up on the COVID backlog, as we talked about earlier, a lot of things weren't required to be monitored, um, but they're now requiring those. And um, anytime you get into it to the point that um, Commissioner Yarborough made earlier, we're bringing in almost the entire staff in terms of getting files ready and, and working to, to make sure that everything's ready and available um, for the monitors. Um, we talked a little bit last time about the uh, regional voucher program impacts. Um, Boulder County Housing Authority and Boulder Housing Partners are raising the payment standards. Um, and so we're looking at that because that really could impact us in terms of um, whether or not landlords will accept our vouchers. What's interesting and what we're seeing is that at this point, we're not seeing people denying our voucher holders. They're taking it. But what we're hearing, I think, from our counterparts in the county and Boulder Housing is that they're having trouble with an uptake in vouchers because of, I'm assuming it's because of the rent bubbles and where it's set. Um, and so, we're watching that to really understand what's going on. We'll probably talk more to you about this. Um, we're just now, as we talked about earlier, growing and gaining, gaining HUD funding increases. The Housing Authority hadn't had increases for a significant number of years on housing choice vouchers. We're now starting to see them. Therefore, we didn't have as much of an increase as Boulder and Boulder County during that process coming into this. That really is performance related, I think. I mean, a big part of that is performance related and the number of vouchers that you actually have out. And we talked about before the number is 420, the number now is 430. 
correct? Um, by the end of the year, we should be at 440. So you're seeing us being able to have more vouchers out, um, even though 520 is a limit. As we're managing it with the two year tool, that's what's allowing us to do that. So i um, watching it pretty close. You know, one of the things that we can say is the regional relationships and the impact of the long run community. Um, we are seeing that starting to show itself as we're probably absorbing um, more vouchers than any other community um, in, in the county. We're digging into some numbers um, to really understand what that impact is, and we'll be back to you all to present that information once we get it. But I do think we're taking a lot of vouchers or we have a lot of voucher holders from Boulder County and Boulder, and Boulder Housing Partners that are actually running, using their vouchers in Longmont. And then we're also gonna look at mental health partners who receive state vouchers as well to get a better sense of the number of voucher holders that we have in our community. So can I ask a question? Does that mean that we are getting more people moving into our community with vouchers, maybe from another place? Correct. So the way that they, there's an agreement that dated back to 1989, 87 to 89, to where the respective groups said that if somebody has a voucher from Boulder County and they utilize it in Walmart, you're not going to engage in the portal process of porting the vouchers over and moving them out. Unlike if somebody has a voucher from Loveland Housing Authority and they come to Longmont, we have a choice as to whether or not we want to port that voucher into our system. There's financials associated with it, admin fees, you don't necessarily get all of them, but you at least have a choice to do that. So what you have is basically within Boulder County, this free form flowing of vouchers mm -hmm. in and out of different communities. And, and so um, that's what we're trying to figure out. In, in exactly how many are coming in from where and, and what does that look like. Um, Could it be because they're not building as much housing for the people? Um, I would say that could potentially be an issue. I think the, the rental cost in those other communities is probably the most significant issue as a whole, the rental cost. Um, I think when we looked at our rental numbers, we're starting to see some draft information coming in in terms of the housing report. And our rental fees are lower than they are in Boulder and, and other places within Boulder County. So it's a combination of the amount of units, the rental rates. And so we want to get a little more depth in this when we bring it back to you. But, okay. you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we say we have 440 at the end of the year, we're going to be able to, to issue, um, based on some numbers that I'm seeing that we've got to verify, I would expect that there's potentially more vouchers coming in from outside of Longmont than we have in total. Mm -hmm. And that's a different conversation that we have to figure out, and Molly and I are going to try to figure it out and start having this conversation with others. Um, Prop 123 is something that we're looking at. This is one of these weird ones because it, it impacts the housing authority, um, but the city has to do it. I will say, I think it's an advantage of having the structure we have because we can look at it from a different perspective versus just purely a, a municipal perspective that's not a housing authority. And so I'm gonna ask you a question that <coughs> is how it's the housing authority commission, but would you like to see this as the city council? So um, we do think that the housing authority, we really think the community will greatly benefit from Prop 123 funds. Um, we have to submit the commitment for LHA habitat in between um, to participate in a portal that just opened uh, a few days ago and also the city, right? So the city has to commit in order for any other agency, including the housing authority, to request funding to use the city map. Um, so we're working on some baseline selections to really give us give us a chance to understand the numbers, and wanted to know if you would like us to consider commitment parameters as a council before we we submit it. Would you want to see the commitment parameters as the council before we submit? 
for the as state the to participate. Before you submit as the city to participate. Yeah, we can submit as staff, but because it's impacting the housing authority and right. there's other, would you like to see it in your other with your other address? Yeah, it would be very interesting to see what we're submitting. Next. Development or do you want to take it? Oh, I can do it. So moving to development updates, um, we wanted to give a couple of quick ones. One is just a, a heads up that on June 6th, the city council will um, see an informational item describing this in more depth. But um, the plan right now that we're moving forward with is to go ahead and use $2.1 million of ARPA funds to purchase the former Royal Mobile Home Park property out of the store drainage fund and house it in the affordable housing fund, um, which is an eligible ARPA expenditure. Uh, the, the price is $2 million. That's a negotiated price based on um, the remnant property, what is left for development, um, and the work still required to get that ready to develop, and also the appraised value. It's kind of the middle ground there. And then it moves an extra $100,000 just for storm drainage staff to keep maintaining it since LHA doesn't have that function really built in. That would just be nice to have that um, maintained as it is until we're ready to develop it. Um, the other thing is we're planning on keeping it in the affordable housing fund for now, not moving it to LHA onto the LHA's books for the moment. Because there's so much going on with the first and main transit station redevelopment, we just want maximum flexibility to see if there's, there's some sort of mixed um, use that could happen there. It would still be affordable housing, but that is the plan for that. So when you see that on our LHA goals, it might be housed within the city for the time being. So is that the one in Boston mm -hmm. uh, yes. across from the materials? Yeah, budget home. Yeah, budget home. Yeah. Yeah. Part of that is also when you drop the land into these deals and when you take, we talked about it today, when you take possession, it impacts everything. Mm -hmm. So it's just cleaner to hold it in the affordable mm -hmm. housing fund knowing that we're going to use it for LHJ, which is why we wanted to talk to you all about this. So we're holding the asset. Yes. Yes. It would be a considered an asset of the affordable housing fund. Yes. Correct. Correct. Cash. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we're going to at some point transfer it to something we can own the housing authority. Yeah, we have to reimburse the next one of these. Yes. That will happen right away. Correct. Yeah. So when you see that project on your LHA goals, that's just um, how it's going to sit for the, for the time being. Didn't you at one time say you were, you were looking at that as attainable? No, that was always affordable. So when we, when we purchased, um, Going back to the flood, this goes, this goes all the way back to the flood and that we knew we needed the property for the channel expansion. Mm -hmm. And then we talked to the council at that time about utilizing it for affordable housing. We were trying to figure out how we would get the dollars to do it. Or if we hit, we're using the ARPA funds, but in terms of looking at first and main as that's now moving along, you know, we have an alignment. And so there may be more that we can do to, to really figure out what's the most advantageous way to leverage that for affordable housing in the broad scheme of this main and a mixed use per transit oriented development. Okay, great. Uh, the next one is. Yes. Oh, sure. Gotcha. What that, what that provokes for me is a simple question. You laid out for us an overall plan for each of our funds mm -hmm. in one, two, one, two. Uh, it would be it would be useful given what you just said, at least from my perspective, if we could get an update on how is that how we deviated from or how consistent or what does our actual expenditure of that project fund look like compared to what those priorities were 18 months ago. Would you like to see that as an LHA update or as city council side? Whatever. I just I just think it would be useful. I couldn't honestly I couldn't especially given what you just said. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain I can answer the question you've asked. Where are we okay. relative to what the plan was that we approved? And just next, we have that report. Sure. Um, so the next one I wanted to update on the affordable assisted living. So these both of these two projects are are further planned out ones. They're not necessarily totally active at the moment. We're just planning ahead for them. Um, 
that is our that's the biggest lift on our ARPA project list that is LHA related because it's just it's a big um, undertaking and it's a specialty type of project. So we've done a ton of research already about development partners and, and ways to do this. Um, but given the ARPA funding, wanting to spend that as quickly as possible, just to safeguard it in case somebody yes, in case um, somebody considers recapturing, we are considering um, whether we go ahead and try and search and do a land banking process and maybe hold land. We have to, of course, talk about with some development potential, uh, or at least our development consultants that can advise on this. If we hold that land, would that still be advantageous to a future deal? But in order to get the ARPA funds spent, that is something we could do um, and have it spent this year. So that's something we're gonna research and look into as an option. And then pick up the development when we're actually ready, capacity-wise, and, and ready to take on the next one. I was going to move to Zinnia unless there's questions on that one. Yeah, keep going. Um, so Zinnia, we already mentioned the closing is coming up. We're in the final push. Um, to compared to Chrisman, which happened in June this, just about this time last year, you'll re probably remember it was a lot of documents flying around at the very last minute. We definitely paced it out much more. There's still, in the end, a couple that are flying around at the last minute, but um, not the, the volume as Chrisman. Um, I just wanted to kind of reflect on what has gone well with this one, especially considering that this is our second full go at this, um, Christmas being the first. Uh, we plan to head well on our timelines. Um, we had really creative solutions for filling gap funding, and our relationship with our partner element has been really productive and, um, and positive. As it, I'm just being brief. But the challenge is, uh, the utilities and the easements at this location just were a real challenge. It is chock full of utilities. So that presented um, challenges in the entitlement process and making sure we got designed, approved in time for building permits and um, getting easements and vacations and everything sorted here towards the end. And then this is also our first time as a third party property manager. So this was the, a potential model that the LHA could use going forward for non-LHA owned properties to um, manage them and collect fees for that management service. And so we really dug in deep on that management agreement, which is what you'd be considering as the city council next May 23rd, um, because we really wanted to get it right. As far as we could project, not ever having done one of these to date. So um, that turned out to be pretty, pretty in depth, making sure we've got a staffing plan and how are we going to um, manage the bank accounts and financials and who's doing what and a lot of arranging of responsibilities and negotiation of, um, of, of you know, our return on this. So that was, it was productive and positive and we're getting there, but it was a big lift to make sure that we were trying to consider the future as much as possible. So that's what I'd say on Zinia. Yeah. It's almost kind of a, a closing Closing statement on Zinnia. Um, for Hover, so first of all, we're at the point where we need to decide a name for the Hover development. The the one that has risen to the top of the development partnership team so far is Ascent at Hover Crossing, but Ascent A S C E N T um, because A is kind of a mountain theme, and the Hearthstone and the Lodge are kind of you know rustic mountain feels as well, but then we're gonna have pretty good mountain views on that top couple floors. And then really it's about the people living there where it's it's a you know a stepping stone to improving your life and um, just an upward trajectory. So that was the proposal so far. So um, unless it is um, objected to by this board, then that's what we would move forward with. Do you have any feedback on that? Any other new ideas? Was always welcome. Anything? Sounds um, like a graphic company or something. I there's a lot of the scent things, so we had to like Google it to make sure that it, it wasn't going to get confused with something else. But um, there was a property called Ascend, but then they changed their name to Alpine, so um, it doesn't seem like there's anything directly comparable in. Not so 
How soon do you plan to go? Um, we are probably in the next by probably by the end of May. We're trying to draft up those partnership documents so that some of them can come to your view for consideration at the joint board meeting. It's not over. It's not over. We were trying to so we were doing kind of plants and flowers at the Sunset Campus, so we didn't want to go too far into plants. Um, so it, it's really interesting. The marketing team of our development partner came up with the, the ideas so far. So. Um, while you think about that, you can always get back to us with ideas. The land transfer. So um, your board approved the purchase and sale agreement at one of your most recent meetings. We are planning on having that land close by next Friday the 26th at the latest, hopefully a little bit sooner, but we're trying to sort out some some uh, clear some title title uh, exceptions to just make sure we have it, everything really straightforward. So that will be occurring, and then the land will be held by LHA at that point, and then we would um, ex be working on a purchase option agreement to the development partnership that they would want in play for the tax credit application on this first. So that would be coming back to you as well. Um, we're continuing to look for gap funding, make sure we've got our, our funding plan set for August tax credit application, including for the ECE. Um, we're doing final design, concept design, um, to the point that you need for a tax credit application. So that's pretty exciting seeing some of those um, uh, visuals come together. And we'll, we'll, once they're a little more fleshed out and have color on them, we'll bring them back so you can see them as well. Um, it will be a big lift through the summer because of that August 1st tax credit application goal. And yeah, that's actually everything I have for Holder. If there's any questions on that one. Yeah. Okay. That's an exciting one as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, for Village on Main, um, we're completing our third party design review and budget prioritization process right now. Um, so we hired actually a, a third party uh, owner's rep, which has been really helpful just to help us um, work that prioritization and, and schedule out how we're gonna um, plan for you know, cost escalation, how do we plan ahead for that, and then um, prioritizing what to do now on your initial budget and what to say for contingency and how to work this all. So that's been um, really productive. And we've hired our relocation team as well. Um, it, we've hired a firm that we worked with for all seven years of our, well, it's actually been 10 years, but we worked for, for seven of the 10 years of the CDBGDR flood recovery program and they really know what they're doing. And they're gonna help us um, uh, work, uh, coordinate all of our resident temporary relocations. And we're gonna, get them into working on contracts right now and we'll get them in to start working with residents here this summer. And finally, doing final gap funding. So uh, both, I should say, both Hover and Village on Main were selected, recommended by the advisory board, the Housing and Human Service Advisory Board, to receive um, affordable housing funds and, and or CDBG funds. So the city council will consider that in June, but um, that's all in process between the city side and the LHA side. So that's everything I have for development. Um, the only thing I want to say, um, you know, so you kind of heard us go through audits high level, um, we'll briefly turn it over to Lisa to talk and Kendra if there's anything you need to cover on the numbers are you good? But, I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they'll quickly go over it, but when we talked about all of this, um, to give you a sense, the, the development team at Boulder County Housing, they have finished the spoke on Kaufman and then they're starting Willoughby Corner phase one senior um, and that's it uh, yeah right mm -hmm. and then one being multifamily in May of 2023 kind of get a sense of the development we're doing um, as we talk about this work um, I wanted you all to think about this piece of it and obviously there's tax dollars going into this but when we compare staffing levels, they have 55 staff members, nine managers, and an executive director. So to get a sense of the bulk of work, they have 900 vouchers, we have 450, so roughly half. Um, 900-ish vouchers. And so when you look at just kind of scope of work and, and, and kind of the press this team's under, you can get a sense that it's more in some cases 
significantly smaller staff in terms of what we're doing, and that's the piece that we're bridging in with the, the city in terms of these projects. And so, kind of wanted to throw that out at the end to say, here's the world, and here's what we're doing it with. Um, now we're doing it different. I mean, we're not self-performing these projects. We're leveraging public-private partnerships, which I think is the best way to do because you can do more and faster. And, and so there is a distinct difference in, I think this group is handling capacity. If we added five more people to this group, we, I think we'd blow the doors off of our competitors just based on what I'm seeing with you now. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, we're still struggling with the financial issues that we inherited. And so, you know, we're, we're tactically adding as we continue to move forward in the budget processes. But that's why you see us pressing the development as hard as we're pressing it because that's going to generate revenue. Yes. Partnerships generate, I mean, a lot of what we're focusing on is revenue generation because there's just not enough revenue generation in the units that we have. Uh, we are adding 40 new units of the group here. Um, heard recently from a, a older city person that they were stuck at 8% of units being affordable so far. Um, do we have that number? What percent of our, of our total? Of our 12? Six and a half. We're at six and a half. Six right. and a half. But it depends. <laughs> when you look at the state numbers and you look at naturally occurring affordable units, I think our percentage is much higher which actually connects to the voucher issue, and this is why we're trying to figure all of this stuff out. We would have never have understood the voucher issue just being the city without being in the LHA to start seeing things. So depending on how you look at it, we only count the affordable units that we built. Permanently we restrict it at, at certain affordability levels. Right, and that was more restrictive. The reason I asked the question is because there were at least two answers, naturally occurring and included, and the ones we know we control that are right. really restricted. So the six and a half is deed restricted. We haven't attempted to count the naturally occurring. That's what we're seeing in the state data. Yeah, that's all pulled from census information and average rents. And, um, and so we know what our percentage is because that's really the number we committed to, right? So that's that's an option. When we're talking about the Prop 123 commitment, that is an option using their data. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we're finding, and we've been talking to our regional partners as well, is if you use just the census data, what the state has provided as an option, in our market, mm -hmm. then a lot, they're counting our naturally occurring affordable, but we really don't have control over what that does in the future. So well, if you, stays right, yeah. so if our prices continue to go up and it leaves that naturally affordable market, no matter how many units we generate and call our deed restricted, the things that we count, then we will never meet that baseline. If So we, we can't predict exactly what would happen in that instance. We'll so, bring this back to you because it's, right. it's, it's a maddening conversation <laughs> right now. And so we'll bring it back and explain it. So yeah, we could theoretically be at 9% affordability if you include naturally affordable, but you can't guarantee that it's going to stay there. Right, right. And I was actually not talking about Prop 123, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the 12% commitment we made in 2017. Same kind of issue. We can't guarantee that it will stay there. So you could, if you count it in the 12%, you could drop if it leaves. So both Boulder and Longmont count permanently deed restricted affordable units because those are the ones that we have control over. So we could, if someone is about to leave, um, exit its deed restriction or age out, then we can go in and, and we have ways to track that. We don't have ways to track and manage all of the naturally affordable. Okay. 
But it needs to be recognized to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this as a whole. And that's what we try to try to figure out. Right, and then so the other side of that on this. Isn't there a housing needs assessment on its way? Yeah. That's, that's when? June twenty seventh. We'll bring them in. They're going to come in and do a presentation for council. We'll look at our results. Or Kendra, you ready? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if it's ready. Well, you guys all have this on your desk because I'm pretty sure <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be able to see that. So um, we do have um, quite an outstanding balance of our past two tenants. Um, within the next couple of months, we are in fact have a meeting with my accountant next week. We are going to start transitioning the, some of these over to the collections, um, at which they get written off our books. So we'll be bringing approvals um, on your end to get those written off. Um, they'll proceed through collections for a period of time. If we can collect on them, um, we do do a pretty high percentage of allowance on most of these because we know with it being affordable housing and low income, it's going to be really hard to see some of this money come back unless we have judgments. Um, and we do have some judgments um, for payment, but not, not enough. Um, so that's what's going to happen here. I mean, we have um, right now our current tenants, we have about a $15,000 balance. So the biggest piece is our um, past two, and a lot of it is our meth units um, that are incurring meth units and eviction units um, that incur the legal costs along with the, the cost to restore units. So if you're reminding me, we got our first meth test. We did. And so we're now at work, we're now work, working through that one to understand how it works and all of those issues. Mm -hmm. How do we test it without possessing that? So if, based on how they're describing how it works, if we have a unit that tests positive and we have the industrial hygienist number, mm -hmm. we will take it into that unit, obviously with personal protective equipment, and then see what the number is that it generates and compare it, compare it to, to that piece. So the next are the financials. Um, what I've done is I've highlighted those areas um, of concern. Um, so we have Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Um, we have senior apartments. These are basically that we're over 50% of our family MC that we're expecting. Um, just in the first quarter. Um, and I know Lisa will go um, in on you know, where their vacancy rates are at today. Um, but for those those instances right there, um, we're getting over 50% of our vacancy already. So if it continues, we're gonna we're gonna overextend that. And then what happens there is if you're not getting that money in, then you're not getting the management fees which, which pay for the admin. Um, I mean it's just a trickle down effect. The peak are just um, insurance proceeds, so obviously these two um, areas have um, MEP units, I believe AMSA and All River have both MEP units, and we're working through the insurance proceeds on those. Um, for the Lodge, Spring Creek, and the Suites, we have the same situation. The Suites has several claims <laughs> um, that we have insurance proceeds coming in on, um, and some of these were also um, continuous of last year's claims. Um, we do have, oh, did I not have one? oh, these yellow ones. Sorry, I can barely see the yellow. So these yellow ones, um, these are over 70, 75% annual vacancy. Um, so we get 75% of what we budgeted for vacancy um, at both the lodge and the suites. Um, so those are getting extremely tight. And in fact, you know, the suites is at 82% and the lodge is at 96. Um, so you gotta, and I know they've started outreach, um, not just going into wait lists and starting to advertise because we're having an issue with certain properties based on the percentage of AMI. 
that it's just too high for some of these people that you know it's at 50 or 60 percent so we're having to outsource outside of the wait list um, to get these units out so people are on the wait list but they can't afford the units and so you're renting them to somebody else is that what's happening it's because, like, if they if they had a voucher, it'd probably be really easy to rent ah. a fifty percent unit. But what they have to tell them is that the fifty percent unit is at this rental rate. Can you afford that? And they say no. Oh. So it, they can't even go, you know, at that rental rate because they don't have a voucher or it's not a PPP unit, um, that type of thing. So we're having to outsource to different agencies to see if they have anybody um, outside. That can. And, and what if if people are people down the waiting list might have vouchers even though the first person doesn't? They've reached out to so my understanding is they go they've exhausted all of those the whole wait list. all the whole wait list and then they even went and looked at other properties. So if somebody was on the wait list for Fall River, they would contact them and say, Hey, we had a unit at AMSA, it's a fifty percent unit, would you want to take it? And you know, I mean Diana said she reached out for AMSA to like 55 different people and we finally just had to outsource it because um, we're getting in a point where our debt to income ratio um, might not pass the loan covenants mm. that are required. <clears throat> so that's a new thing, new, new thing I can't think of because get, we're being monitored on the loan side. For AMSA. So and I think that's the minimum wage because they're the <laughs> Well, this is an age restricted unit, so. There's so many issues. Yeah, there's so many issues, and that's related to how it's financed via mm -hmm. the life tax and the chapter piece in terms of if it's a 50% AMI unit, and we may have to start evaluating based on where we are. The problem can you? Get someone in it. The problem is that, that creates a snowball effect down the road. So. And they're um, the waiting list when they come in to put their name on the waiting list. There, Diana is explaining the programs and, and what the rent is. And I think what was happening was people were putting their name on the waiting list, thinking that was going to be thirty percent of their income. Um, even though their income supported that amount, they couldn't actually afford that amount. So we're trying to up front let them know what this program is um for um so for lha um the only the only thing is we're, we're over in some administrative expenses on 615 main but that's because we also have an appraisal done um so we can have some information um, to to say um and then LHDC had some additional income, and that was due to the um, exit of the investor of Village Place. Um, LHA loaned LHDC money to get the investor, because we want to get the investor out before we go into the sanitation. Um, they, we were very fortunate that they knocked our exit tax in half, so we only had to pay $281,000, but that would get paid back to LHTC, which will pay back LHA. <laughs> Again, the closing of the loan. So that's kind of first quarter in a nutshell, unless anybody has any questions. Other than that, it looked like we're pretty much within 25%, 25 to 28% on most of um, the expenditures or whatever is that we were expecting, which is a Um, at the end of March. So, quarter or now? No, April. 
the four of them are now rented, and this two have rented. I've and all this morning. All from outsourcing. All from outsourcing. Ah, but that's very good news. Yeah. And now you're saying if you get five more vouchers, that's five more people who can afford each of them. Were they vouchers? I believe so, because we went to um, Longmont Senior Services and we let them know, hey, if you have people looking, we have immediate opens openings if they can support this rent or have a voucher we can get them in. So the last is the voucher count. Um, at 12-1 of 2022, we were at 405. We've been trying to get to 420 for a really long time, but it's like a roller coaster ride. People get off, we have fraud, um, or they're losing their vouchers. Um, we finally reached in April um, 430 vouchers, and we currently have um, three that were um, released at the very end of the month. Um, so that you will see those represented in, the, in, in May. And then we have eight on the wait list. So we're at about 441. Um, and that's where we plan to be by the end of the year, as we start to capture it. And we have pretty much the two year tool pretty down to a science. <laughs> So um, they, we are getting like attrition rate, which would mean like people leaving the program on a monthly basis. It's about 10%, so it's almost like four to five vouchers a month um, we're actually losing. Um, so Tracy and her team are keeping up on that, and that's what wasn't happening. So we were losing vouchers, but then they weren't reissuing those. So then when they don't reissue you those, you're still looking for these five that have already been issued, but now you really should be 10. So they 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 got they got it going. They got it going. <laughs> so yeah, and we did get four hundred thousand extra dollars um, this year for half funding, um, and that will push in the, the four forty that we can go up to, along with the hundred and five percent of increase to fair market to go to one hundred and five percent. And the more we lease up, the more admin. <coughs> Admin costs that we incur. Yeah. Um, we do. Yeah. For vouchers. For vouchers. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You want the occupancy reports? So we were, we ended April still at ninety three percent, but I just pulled the numbers for the last two weeks. My team last time I reported we changed how we were doing the wait list. Um, we're keeping them open. We're we have Diana the admin calling on those and helping to pre fill those. Um, pulling the numbers right before this meeting, we are projected to end the month at 97%. Um, most of these units have been leased across the board, like we talked about Aspen Senior, um, but most of them were leased from the wait list. Even the suites have a couple of their down units, one is down for flood, one is down for meth, both projected to be done by the end of the month, are already leased and ready to go. So, been very active on our side. For uh, meth units, we did add two new units this month at the Briarwood. We have to that came in positive, and um, <laughs> that's where our occupancy is. Any questions on occupancy? And then just a quick overview of the property updates. Um, one thing that's not on here is we are having our annual fair housing training that you're all invited to. We'll have um, our fair housing tra trainer out of Denver come up west. He's a great trainer. It's June 20th from 8.30 to 11.30, and we'll be doing it in the chambers. Um, are you at Cinco de Mayo? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, we held Cinco de Mayo events the whole first week of May at all the properties, and it was amazing. Um, my staff is sick of chicken, but it was <laughs> nice. We had the dancers from Longmont Senior Services show up at one of the properties, a magician at another, singers at another, so it was quite active at a lot of the properties for that. They did a full on events. Um, Great turnout. We try to guess the numbers of residents that are going to show up, and we were surprised that each each guess we made there was more participants. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing currently doing declutter events and bringing dumpsters to the properties, and staff is helping residents get stuff to the dumpsters. We've completed three of them. Mm -hmm. Where we one property we even had a dump, a dumpster halfway through a thirty yard because it was so full of stuff. Wow. So very helpful, and. LHA is currently fully staffed for the first time. All positions are filled. Uh, suites, 
we uh, got rid of security last year and brought in building attendants, and I have never seen the suite so clean, and these building attendants are hands-on, over even the night shifts, they're calling public safety if they see something out of the norm around the building, down the street, they're very involved in working with Sarah and um, other members of the police department. And um, CORE and public safety have been uh, playing a major role at this week lately. We've had a lot of um, increased mental health situations, but CORE, Sarah, Dave, Kennedy, they have all been there right by our side helping us navigate those. Um, and one other thing I just want to touch on for Spring Creek and Fall River management um, teamed up and partnered with Eldershare. They, Eldershare has been bringing in food distributions for years at these properties, but we saw some ways that we can improve it. So the manager and assistant manager went and got training through Eldershare and have taken over the distributions and we have a little bit more say in the kind of foods that are coming, um, what our residents are requesting, and um, actually seeing some participation of residents who had not participated in years. So nice. we're excited to be more hands on there. Okay. So I'm going to be doing um, public health and safety updates on behalf of Sarah Arney. Um, we already mentioned the meth detector. That was one of the things she wanted to make sure you all knew about. That uh, that's we've been that's received, and now we're going to go forward with our testing. Um, tacking on to uh, the issues that we've been having around mental health and bringing in core and and MHP, really been working all the way around the residents to try and address their, help them get through their issues, make sure they can maintain successful housing, do everything we can to make sure that happens. But I really do, which Lisa touched on, but I really do want to um, stress that we're working with MHP, that we had a meeting with them to really dig down and it. We got to some of the issues that have been really needing to be talked about for a long time. And I think that we're on a good foot and we've got, and use that as a jumping off point to coordinate with them and partner, improve that partnership and ongoing as well. So the issues were with MHP, not issues with the residents of the suites? It's more, um, it's, we're coming together around residents of the suites who are needing supports okay. from all of us. And then it's coming down to, we're figuring out just things that people may have, um, misunderstood or about how what roles and responsibilities are um, what to expect when you know a, an MHP person or a, a resident calls the police and what mm -hmm. okay. there's just a lot of there was just a productive <coughs> conversation that happened about um, working with MHP as a partner for the resident right. yeah um, with, with core um, I always have this question um, it, it seems to me that crisis events do not respect the clock, but CORE does. What's the procedure when um, when there's a crisis at you know, 8 p.m. Um, who comes, who, who handles that? So, when Sarah's here next time, we'll talk about it in the budget we added the fourth court team. So we are adjusting that, I think we're full of staff now. But we do train our officers with some of the similar, um, they go through similar training the board does in terms of managing it. But I think we're, we've definitely extended the hours. I just can't remember what it is. But that's part of this conversation is to understand who does what, when, who calls, what do you do. So I can ask that question again when Sarah's done. Yeah. And then her last update was just um, that we're using in con in consort with the HCI team for the city um, to get the security cameras across all properties, make sure they're all in the same system, and talk to the city system. So she's been helping us uh, manage that project, and we have bids, and we're looking to move forward on them here next week. So that was everything that I had on Sarah's list. All right. Any other discussion from commissioners? I'm just starting to lose the amount of work that you do. Mm -hmm. You're always smiling when you're in here. Mm -hmm. And I know that doesn't translate everywhere, but I appreciate it. Come by on Friday. <laughs> 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 wow. Yeah, maybe. Well, <laughs> it's clear how these how well <laughs> things are working. Um, and, and as a, you know, 
as an ex-boss, I mean, it seems like even when things aren't working, you can describe the problem now as opposed to at the beginning things were mysteries. Yeah. So that's kind of, a little better. Okay, I'm sorry. I think that's okay. okay. <laughs> I just thought you were wrong. Well, it looks like two commissioners moved and seconded. Yes. Aye. 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 Aye.